The main point of today's video is to take a look at the ASRock Rack Rome D82T. This is a full ATX SP3 AMD Epic server workstation motherboard. But we're gonna talk about some projects that I've got planned because uh, hey, it may be audience participation time. I'm not really too sure, but we can take a deeper look at this motherboard and maybe some options that we got coming down the road. <music> Now, how I ended up with this motherboard, I, I, we, we bought this motherboard. This is for a project. I'm actually kind of surprised how inexpensive this motherboard is. It might be because of the name. I think Azrock accidentally named it Rome, when it is in fact compatible with Milan CPUs. So I've got a 72F3 epic CPU here. This is eight cores. But this is actually a really interesting processor. We'll come back to this. This is the fastest processor that AMD has, the fastest server processor. 4.1 gigahertz. We'll come back to that. This motherboard's interesting because it's micro ATX. This particular one comes with dual 10 gig interfaces, but it also comes with these cables. It turns out server grade cables are actually kind of expensive. This is a breakout cable. It'll give you four SATA connections. The motherboard has two of those. So you get a total of eight SATA connections. That's pretty awesome. We'll come back to that too. Dual M.2 screws in the box. So this is an almost completely normal layout ATX motherboard. The motherboard power connector is at the very top edge of the motherboard. It's, it's turned a little bit. It is designed for server airflow. This layout is very similar to a Threadripper Pro motherboard, but we've also got a 30 pin dual five gigabit header on this motherboard. We got two M.2 or two high density connectors, which are SATA only and seven, seven pin fan headers. Seven pin fan headers? Yeah, it turns out this is designed for a server with really high RPM fans. So, you know, two, three amps is not enough for a server grade fan. We've, we've got servers that have Delta fans that are, you know, 10, 12 amps. <laughs> Each fan could be 60 watts. So the extra connectors on the header uh, help provide the extra power. One other note with this motherboard, it is dual M.2, however, one of them is 110 millimeters and the other one is 80 millimeters. So if you're planning on using dual 110 millimeter M.2s, well, it's not gonna fasten because it's gonna sort of go past the, uh, the right angle connector on the end. You could make it work, but uh, there's not actually a screw. Dual 80 millimeter, however, no problem. This motherboard will also work with the teeny tiny Keoxia, the BG5 M.2, if you're gonna run that for some crazy reason. A lot of work on this motherboard as well. It does have the standoff for it. We've got all the PCI Express lanes. This thing's 128 PCIe lanes and eight memory channels. We got some big old heat sinks down here in the uh, <laughs> down here in the slot area. That's for our dual 10 gig interface. Like a server motherboard, we've got VGA out, onboard serial. There's not a lot of USB to speak of, although there is type C at the rear IO. Type C, yeah, type C, as well as the type C header. In addition to the two Intel 10 gig uh, NICs that I mentioned, we also have an onboard A speed 2500, which has a one gigabit PHY for remote IPMI, remote management, remote control. Now again, it's attention to detail. What I really like about this motherboard, look at the connectors along the bottom. They are for a right angle. So if you are going nuts with really long and tall cards, this motherboard is gonna work out for you because the important connectors along the bottom edge are at a right angle, which means they plug in through the bottom of the motherboard. Of course, you may need to take that into account when you're building your system. You may have to use something like the Fractal Meshify XL if you're gonna put this in a desktop case. But again, a server case, usually not really a big deal for a server case. This motherboard also has two low profile Oculink connectors. It uses the corner style locking mechanism. It can be a little tricky to find cables that actually have the corner locks. And uh, those cables really wanna come unplugged when you're building a server based around those. Unfortunately, I don't have any of those cables that work at PCI Express 4. If anybody knows of a good source for those, let me know. Really could use some. You also only get this quick installation guide. I'll also call special attention to two jumpers located at the very upper edge of the motherboard near the rear I.O. This enables extra power for the, uh, the dim area so that you can run non-volatile dims. Non-volatile dims is still, I think, perhaps a little bit experimental on the Epic platform. I'm sure there are a couple specific customers out there that are working on non-volatile dims, but uh, if you're doing that, chances are you're spending millions of dollars of your own on an R&D project. Uh, I'm not aware of a qualified solution for that in the marketplace, but I'd love to be wrong about that because non-volatile memory, you can do some really cool stuff with software. That's maybe a different video. Now, our 
72F3, this is the processor that I'm going to use for this build. I'm basically building a storage server. This is actually a backup replica server. So this is gonna have some hard drives on it that host an array. It doesn't really have clients. It is connected to the network with the dual 10 gig interface, so I'll, I'll be able to use that. But it could potentially have a crap load of hard drives. But like I say, it doesn't have a lot of clients. Its client is another server at a physical different site. And so we'll maybe do some videos on setting that up. I'm trying to find a good rack mount case. I don't really care if it's hot swap or not. Probably gonna add like eight to 20 hard drives to start. And then for additional hard drives, I may just add uh, external SAS controllers with external disk shelves. I'm aware that ASRock has a, a pretty nice 1U option that will hold a lot of drives. That might be a thing. I might pick up that, that chassis. But I'm just sort of curious what you guys have seen in the audience and stuff like that for a storage server. The 72F3, strictly speaking, should be a CPU that you only buy when you are constrained by a license. It's 4.1 gigahertz. It also has something called the configurable TDP. So part of the testing for this motherboard is to see how well it does with monster TDP parts like the Milan X 7763, 280 watts. And we'll, we'll go into the testing results for that in a little bit. But this CPU out of the box is I think 165 watts, but you can see TDP up to 200 watts. With this particular CPU, I've tested on other motherboards enabling CTDP to 200 watts. And when you do that, pretty much every workload that you run on this CPU is running at 3.9, 4.0, 4.1 gigahertz. This is an eight chiplet CPU. This is not a cost down part. In fact, it's very expensive. You have eight chiplets. Each chiplet only has one core enabled. That means that every single core has its own 32 megabytes of cache for a combined total of 256 megabytes of L3 on this processor. That's insane. This is a great processor when you wanna run something that uh, charges you by the core and charges you a lot of money, but also on bare metal something like Microsoft SQL Server. Now you can create a Microsoft SQL Server on a 128 core monster machine and only give it a certain number of cores, but the problem is that when you do that, typically those monster core count servers come down in clock speed. It might only be 3.35 gigahertz for the maximum turbo as opposed to 4.1. The sweet spot of the market though is the 16 core version of this, which is the 73F3. This is the 72F3. The 73F3 does clock a little lower, 4.0 gigahertz. The power situation is a little different with the doubling of cores. You only go up to 240 watts, but uh, 4.0 gigahertz adds a bathtub curve of power utilization. Real world, you'll see 3.7 to 3.9 gigahertz on that processor. Again, it depends on the workload, depends on, on everything else you're doing. That's two cores per chiplet that are enabled. So two cores share 32 megabytes of L3 per chiplet. Again, 256 megabytes of L3 per CPU. You could run two 72F3s in a dual socket machine. What that does for you is it opens up a lot more memory capacity because each CPU, of course, can support its own memory. And of course, with this thing, I can pretty easy, you know, from a commodity standpoint, equip this thing with two terabytes of memory. Theoretically, I could do a little bit more. I probably would need another motherboard that will give me two DIMMs per channel instead of one. But yeah, two terabytes supported on an eight core processor is just absolutely nuts. So if I were building a server like this, the cost differential between the eight core and the 16 core is negligible from, from uh, AMD. So I'd probably go for the 16 core. And why I would go for the F series CPU as opposed to any of the other CPUs is because of the really high clock speed. The software that I'm using doesn't really scale all that well across multiple cores. So how well it performs for storage and parity calculation is going to depend on one, how many channels it's using on the network side, how many streams basically, and two, that raw base core clock speed. And I'm really gonna get a lot more mileage out of 4.1 gigahertz than I am 3.35. So this is pretty much the perfect CPU for the job in that scenario. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, it might be nice to have 16 cores instead of eight, but AMD sent me the CPU and I'm going to put it to good use. I'd initially considered the ITX version of this motherboard, as I mentioned for this build, because I don't really need the memory capacity and I don't really need all that much PCI Express connectivity, but this motherboard was ultimately a little less expensive. And so that's what I picked for this build. So let's, uh, let's pop the motherboard out of this and let's do some testing. No BIOS update, no. 
Whee. So in order to proceed with the update, first we had to find this on the network. If you plug and unplug the management LAN on the motherboard a few times, and then check your DHCP server, it should automatically get an IP address. So you can compare the MAC address on the sticker on the motherboard to the IP address to find the IP address, because otherwise it's postcode 46, it won't boot. Critical, it's like, oh, we gotta return the motherboard. No, it's just got an old BIOS on it. And when we went to download the BIOS from ASRock, it says, oh, you need to update the baseband management controller as well. That's the IPMI interface, basically. It's a computer within a computer for managing the computer, because that's just how we roll. So, maintenance. We will do the BIOS update first. We'll select the file and start the BIOS update. I'm gonna do the BIOS update before the management controller. The system also has to be off, but it'll warn you about shutting the computer off. You don't want to leave it on postcode 46 for a long time. It's basically telling you that it doesn't understand that Milan CPU. It only understands Rome. And then once it gets done uploading, you have to click proceed again, because of course you do. Come on. Once the BIOS update is done, you got to log back in. You don't need to boot the machine yet. In fact, it probably doesn't work. There's a reason that it says, hey, you should probably update this. So we're gonna go to firmware update. This time we'll choose the IMA file. It's gonna tell us all the settings and everything that's gonna overwrite. It's even gonna overwrite the network settings, but that's okay because the network settings are on the default DHCP, so. Now, if when you're doing all this, it doesn't immediately show up on the network, that's completely normal. It takes the BMC a good solid, you know, one to two minutes to start up. So this whole update process, it's gonna seem like the motherboard goes unresponsive for kind of a long time. You should just let it sit and do its thing. It's, it's gonna do the thing here where it's doing processing and upload a file. It's gonna give us a confirmation step probably. Don't be alarmed and definitely don't restart the motherboard. That, that might be something that puts you in, into an impossible situation. And then once it gets halfway done, you have to hit proceed to flash, except it's flash to proceed. Woo. You'll get this pop up after a few minutes. Firmware reset has been called, hit okay. This is the part, you know, give it a couple of minutes. If it doesn't come back right away, that's okay. Just give it a few minutes. And once it's back up, you'll find that the password's been reset because that was overwritten. The default password is admin admin. So when you do this process, you really want to change your password immediately. In fact, you probably want to disable the admin account and make something else, something called something else other than admin, because that's just the best practice. Boom, we're back in. BMC firmware version. I don't think that changed. That's okay. That doesn't necessarily change immediately. Sometimes this only changes when the system boots. But let's try to boot this up now. Well, the benchmarks are in, the results are kind of interesting. I mean, it's a plucky little eight core that holds its own, but I had some experience building this machine that I want to share. First, every single one of those PCIe slots is PCI Express 4.0 by 16. Gosh, AMD Epic is a monster. 128 lanes, even on this plucky little eight core CPU. Yeah, that's the power of Epic. The second slot, I will you know, sort of hedge a little bit on that. There's jumper settings that allow you to configure if you want the Oculink connected and you want the SlimSAS connections on, on the front as well. Each one of those uses four lanes. So if you enable all four of them, you're gonna lose the entire PCIe slot too. I think the, the more sane configuration is to drop that slot down to by eight and then have your SlimSAS connections or to have your Oculink con connections. But however you wanna do it, you can have SlimSAS or you can have Oculink and then the slot runs at PCI Express by eight. It does that with PCI Express switches. Now your onboard 10 gig, that of course is also connected directly to the CPU. That's an Intel X550. It's a pretty solid 10 gigabit interface and of course it works flawlessly with Linux. For a test setup, I used 32 gigabyte DIMMs, registered ECC memory. The Epic platform does require load reduced DIMMs or registered error correcting DIMMs. It won't work with unregistered error correcting DIMMs or uh, you know, unregistered non-error correcting DIMMs as far as that goes. But it is up to an eight channel platform, even though it's only eight cores. 
So like I said, this thing is plucky, but if you wanna check out the full benchmarks below, you can. There's a link to the Pharonix test suite, and you can really see this thing's pretty nice. All right, I wanna give you some ideas for possible content for next time. So yes, processor mounted in motherboard, RAM, everything else, and rear IO. A lot of cool stuff going on with rear IO. A lot of cool stuff that we saw overall in general with this motherboard, but check this out. We've got our mini SAS HD connections and our mini SAS HD cables. But instead of going from mini SAS HD to SATA, it's just straight through. However, IC dock. <laughs> if you're DIYing server stuff, IC dock is pretty cool. This is 24 SATA bays, two and a half inch, and it's designed really for SSDs, not mechanical hard drives. But you could run a heck of an array in, in a tiny data cube like this. 24 drives times four terabytes, okay. Level one can't afford that. Maybe when we get past a million subs, I don't know. But 24 drives, four terabytes, in a tiny micro cube. But we've got our mini SAS HD connections back here. There are six of them in total, but I can address four of them really quickly. This might give you guys some inspiration to give me some inspiration to see what sort of things you might like to build as I'm sort of putting this together. Because this is gonna take me a couple of videos, a couple of months probably. All right, so just that easily, I've got the first eight bays on this thing attached to the motherboard, wired in, ready to go. Whether I'm gonna run ZFS or BTRFS or Linux MD or uh, you know, a Red Hat cluster, whatever, that's pretty much it. When I wanna connect the other four, I can do that through a PCIe add-in card and adapter. There's also those Oculink connectors. I can sort of break those out, maybe and run them over here for the other four. But again, cabling and everything else like that gets a little sketchy. I know I can do it through the PCIe adapters. I'm not sure I can do it through the other headers. Something to experiment with. Mechanical hard drives are also gonna matter. To that end, I'm also planning a little bit of a grudge match. I've got Toshiba N300 mechanical hard drives. These are continuous magnetic recording. This is a three year warranty. It's designed for a multi-drive RAID system. It has a rotational velocity sensor. These are designed for 24 seven operation. These are gonna be pretty good drives, I think. These drives are rated for 180 terabytes per year. So, you know, when you get these really high capacity drives, they're not really designed to last as long. And then I've got the five year warranty with the free data recovery should it actually die, which I have a feeling is gonna be real hard on Seagate someday. Both of these came from Micro Center, by the way. But this is the uh, Iron Wolf Pro three and a half inch drive. You don't, I don't really need the Pro. But uh, 16 terabytes. Again, continuous magnetic recording, five year warranty. A lot of similar characteristics to the Toshiba. But we're gonna put both of these through a grueling grudge match. One of them or both will probably end up being murdered by the tests that I have planned. But it might be a couple of months before we see the, the videos from that. So if you have experiences, like if you built your NAS around the N300 at eight, 10, 12 terabytes, or the Iron Wolf Pro, again, eight, 10, 12 terabytes, let me know on the forums at level one or in the comments below because I kind of want to compile some data from the community. And I know it's anecdotal, but I can still use that as I'm sort of planning and doing my own testing. And these drives plugged into this thing through one of our LSI disk shelves from you know the original level one storage server build, that's probably gonna factor in in a future video. But for now, this has been a quick look at the Rome D82T motherboard and its performance characteristics. Very impressive. Even if you wanted to run a 7763 on this motherboard, you totally could do it. 280 watts CTDP, it's 240 watts out of the box, but you can turn it up to 280 watts. You just gotta make sure you got adequate airflow everywhere in the case. I'm Wendell, this is Level One, I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level One forum.